you please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And uh, if you're a first time visitor with us here today, uh, this is a, uh, we do have junior church for the kids. Kids are not required to go to junior church. But if you're a first timer, maybe your kids would be a little bit shy about going into the junior church. You could go to church with them, uh, and at least until they're comfortable. But uh, we certainly uh, would encourage you to send them in there. We're going to have a great study in here. And I do have the Hershey's Kisses. The junior church doesn't. But <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 in your scripture here today. And you may have noticed that our services are a little bit noisy or a little disorganized sometimes because of people talking and so forth. And I just want to just chat with you about that a little bit here today. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm actually fine with that. I'm fine with things not being as quite... Can I help you? Oh, yes. Here, take that Bible too. Take that one back there, somebody else's. Okay. All right, you're out of here. Uh, sometimes we have, you know, things are just not as, quite as smooth and well organized as I wish that they were, sort of. Uh, but the reality of it is the reason for that is because we are trying to reach people. And we're picking up kids on the bus that haven't gone to church before. Uh, and, and you know what? There's uh, behavior, I think, that when you grow and, and do well spiritually, behavior that you learn. But uh, that's, not, that's not something that we really need our kids to know before they come. Is it? So we don't have any requirements for anybody coming here. And so we want to just be gracious. If you notice maybe uh, kids getting up during the service, and going to the bathroom or uh, wandering around, that sort of thing, it would be fine for you to, to politely correct them and say, hey, you know, wait, wait to go to the bathroom or wait till an appropriate time. And by the way, make sure the adults behave as well. If you're an adult, make sure you behave yourself <laughs> so that the kids don't have to uh, wonder how that they ought to behave. They ought to see good examples from us. By the time they get to be our age, they'll have the advantage over many of us who didn't grow up going to church and didn't know uh, what, it, what it's supposed to be like in the environment. But I hope our church never changes. I hope we never stop reaching people and having new kids. We've got several new kids that are with us here today in our service, rode our bus. A lot of kids that normally do weren't able to come today, but a lot of new ones did. And I just praise the Lord for that because probably most of them don't know Jesus as their Savior yet, but they're going to. And by the way, speaking of Jesus, has anyone told you today that God loves you very much? He does. And the circumstances, the things you're going through in life, perhaps may be such that you're not feeling much of God's love. But I do want you to know in this place today that God does love you very much. He loves you so much that if you knew how much He loved you, you wouldn't begin to grasp the, the beginning of understanding how much He actually loves you. God loves you so much that even though you and I aren't perfect, and we're not, you know, sometimes we look at ourselves as victims of our life or victims of our circumstance because of things that have happened to us. You know, God doesn't judge us for the evil that's done to us. God only judges us for our sin, for the evil that we've committed. And you know something? In spite of the fact that evil's been done to us, we're still evil ourselves. And we deserve God's judgment. And God, who's a just and right judge and who will judge the evil that's been done to us, in our place judged His Son, Jesus and gave us the opportunity to have eternal life simply by receiving Jesus as our Savior. And friend, if you find Jesus as your Savior, that will be the beginning to you knowing God's love. And that will be the beginning to God taking all the things in your life and sorting them out and uh, beginning to make everything make sense and to give you a bright future. If heaven's your home, my friend, things can only get better. Things can't get worse. Well, I'm surely delighted that you're here today. And if you found your place in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read a familiar passage. And whenever we do that, I always ask people to pay special attention. Because sometimes when you're familiar with something, you just kind of quote it in your mind, but your brain checks out. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and I'm not sure how anybody could focus when somebody comes to the door looking like that. But, uh... <laughs> Charlie, we wanted to... You lost. You lost the contest because you weren't here. So you took, like, last place with your high water pants and your yellow. Somebody said this morning that uh, a lot of big birds were, uh, were uh, lost their lives in order to make that suit. <laughs> or that suit. Anyway, <laughs> only Charlie. The funny thing about it is, is that it's really not funny because Charlie would wear that. Like, you just see him sitting there looking smug. 
Like, yeah, I would. I, I am wearing it, actually. And I'd wear it anytime I wanted to, not just on Silly Suit Sunday. Hi, Jonathan. Good to see you, bud. Okay, let's go ahead and read the Scripture. I think we've eliminated our distractions, and so let's see if we can get into it. Verse 13 of Matthew 5. The Bible says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now let's pray, and let's ask God's help with our understanding today. God, we do need your help. Lord, we need help with focus. We need help just having the attention to look at the Scripture and ask the question, What are you saying to me, God? And God, what should I do in light of what you're saying? I pray that question would not only be answered, but God, we would have clarity from your Holy Spirit. She would show us specifically what you want us to do, how you want us to live in light of what we learn in the Scripture here today. God, help us with our review to be concise and clear enough. And God, I just pray that, again, you would challenge us by the Scripture. Help us to desire to be disciples. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Just for sake of review, I want to just bring us up to where we are. We began our study in Matthew looking at the genealogies, and that was vitally important, wasn't it? One of the things that I see in Matthew's genealogy that sets it apart from the other genealogies is the careful inclusion of individuals that should not have belonged. Do you remember the people that if you were going to pick a line or a heritage for the perfect Son of God that perhaps you would have excluded? I think of Tamar. And boy, what a terrible relationship she had with her father-in-law in order to have a son who was in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And yet Judah, her father, said she's been more righteous than I have. I think of Rahab, who literally was a very disreputable, uh, had a very disreputable occupation. And yet God saved her, changed her life, and then put her into the lineage of Jesus Christ. I think of Ruth, the Moabitess, who was a very dear, sweet, uh, pure young woman. And yet, uh, she wasn't Jewish, and she didn't have the promises of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And yet, God wanted us to know that Gentiles are every bit as important to Him, and every bit as much of His plan, if they'll become part of it. And God used Ruth in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And the list goes on. One of the things we're reminded is that God is not impressed with a person or with a lineage. God can use anyone, and God can take anyone's environment, anyone's background, anyone's circumstance, and when God makes you righteous because of what Jesus did when He died on the cross for your sins, my friend, you're qualified because of what He made you, not because of what you are. And, uh, you know, you and I just need to really understand the person, the character of God. Something we've emphasized and is becoming increasingly important to emphasize in Matthew is that though Matthew is a gospel, much of Matthew deals with the, when it talks about the gospel, it deals with discipleship. Now, let me clarify that just a little bit to maybe help you understand something. You say, Pastor, if you say that Matthew's a gospel, but that discipleship isn't the gospel, then why is discipleship in the gospel? Well, let me help you with something. The gospel is Jesus. The gospel's good news. And the good news is Jesus, who Jesus was when Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins. When Jesus was instructing His disciples about how to follow Him, my friend, Jesus is the Gospel. Following Jesus is discipleship. Do you see the distinction? In other words, we know who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And Jesus, when He's telling His disciples behaviors that are required of a disciple, is not telling them how to receive Him. He's the Gospel. Discipleship is for followers. Something else we emphasize that I think is important for us to remember is that uh, disciples, uh, a person can be a disciple and not be saved. We saw the illustration of that with Judas. Judas was one of the twelve, wasn't he? 
No one would argue Judas wasn't a disciple of Jesus, and yet Judas was lost. And so, friend, I want us to understand that following Jesus, that is the behavior of a follower of Jesus, is not something that saves us. And I will say that the Scripture does in other places clarify works for a believer. See, a lost person, when he tries to do something that is good works, the Bible says his righteousness is as filthy rags. But the Bible teaches that a person who is saved is created in Christ Jesus unto good works or every good work. And so a believer, that is a disciple who is a believer, is able to work for Jesus. In working for Jesus, that isn't the gospel. The gospel is Jesus, that Jesus, that He's a sinner, that Jesus died on the cross for His sins, and that if He received Jesus, He's born again, He has an eternal home in heaven. That's the gospel. The gospel is Jesus. But a disciple can follow Jesus in the works that he is able to do as a follower of the Lord Jesus, my friend, are, are works that will give Him eternal rewards in heaven. You can, as a disciple, work for Jesus, but you can't work to be saved. We see the distinction. I think it's very, very clear. And yet, sadly, individuals who ought to really have a better grasp and understanding of what the gospel is really don't have that clarified in their minds. They don't understand the difference. And it's because of, uh, I hate to say it, but it's because of poor study of the Scripture. It's poor application of the Scripture. Now, here we are in our text today, and we're see, we are really seeing after we saw that a disciple thinks differently, we're going to see that the behavior of a disciple is important for, for um, I'm sorry, the behavior of a disciple is important or necessary for lost people to see Jesus. Okay, so last week, remember we saw the things the Bible said are blessings, and we looked at how different the way a disciple's thinking is, a follower of Jesus, how different a follower of Jesus thinks, than the world thinks. The Bible says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We think, no, there's no blessing in being poor. There's no blessing in being poor in spirit even. Ah, try it sometime and see if there's a blessing in it. Well, the illustration, what an immediate illustration of it, is one that Jesus used. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? I want to ask you a question. Who is more blessed, the Lazarus or the rich man? See, a follower of Jesus understands that blessing isn't what the world says it is. A blessing is different than the world than what the world thinks it is. You know, a person in Lazarus' physical life on this earth would say he had it pretty badly. A man was covered in sores. He begged for the crumbs at the rich man's table, and he would have eaten the crumbs that fell off of the rich man's table. That's no way to live. And yet the Lord Jesus, in his, God's economy, uh, Lazarus... Lazarus was all right. He was the one who was blessed. The rich man is today, my friend. Today, Lazarus is with Jesus. Today, the rich man's in hell. God knows what blessing is, doesn't He? Blessed are the poor. The Bible says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, I think that a person who has never gone through mourning is a person who is actually missing out on a lot of perspective in life. This time of the year, and particularly this year, Last year, not so much. The year before was that way. This time of the year, it just seems like a lot of people are passing from this life into the next. I just have know so many people that I know that in the last month and, and even right now are in the final stages of their life and getting ready to uh, go to heaven. And I'll tell you something. When you lose somebody, I can't think of mourning that, that is greater than the loss of a loved one. I just can't think of any other area of mourning than to lose someone who is a, who is a dear one, who is a loved one. And yet, I sadly know from personal experience that a person who has not mourned is first of all a person who never knows what real comfort is. And secondly, a person who has never been comforted is a person who doesn't know a lot about life. And so God's economy, God's way of thinking is true. Now I can't go through each of these, uh, each of these things that Jesus say are blessings because I want to get into today's text. And it really is one of those contexts that if you have made the decision to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus, it's a context that you really could just go back to this section and study it. And it's one of those contexts that is a purpose statement for your life. Now, Jesus has told them in, the, in his, really his order or his uh, orientation meeting 
for being disciples. And that's what I see this passage as. You ever got a new job and you've had to go through orientation? Shamir just did, didn't you? He's working at McAllister's in plantation. So if you want to have the best customer service in the world, figure out what his schedule is and go to McAllister's in plantation. But uh, Shamir's uh, working at McAllister's and actually missed church two Wednesday nights. One of the best messages I've ever preached in my life. Shamir was not there for because he was in <laughs> orientation. It was a great message, wasn't Mr. Tosh? Yeah. Oh, wow. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he had to go through orientation to teach him kind of, you know, how to be an employee at McAllister's. This is this is how you get in, you know, get to be part of the team and uh, understand the process and how how the company works and all these things. If you've ever been oriented into a company or into a group, you kind of understand this discipleship thing. Jesus said, to the, remember what his words to some of the disciples were? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. How many of those men do you suppose were experienced fishermen of men? None of them. And so this is training and orientation is, is what Matthew chapter 5 is. So when you read your Bible and you study Matthew chapter 5, just you could jot a note there, discipleship orientation. Give you a little bit of a perspective on it. Jesus is not explaining how to be born again. I don't know how many times I heard the gospel preached from Matthew chapter 5. The gospel is Jesus. It's not discipleship orientation. So first of all, they're told the mindset of a company. How many of you all have ever been to... Well, let's just ask it this way. How many of you all have never been to Chick-fil-A? Mrs. Dollins, bless your heart. You wonderful. Never go. Stand strong. Don't do it. It's a waste of money anyway. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Ryan. Ryan looks like she wants to kill me right now. <laughs> okay. When at Chick Fil A, after they have served you and you say thank you, what do they say at Chick Fil A? My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Now. I, somebody who is a Chick-fil-A employee. Taj, is this true? They don't make you say that at Chick-fil-A? No, sir. Where do they get that? Why does every Chick-fil-A employee anywhere say my pleasure when you say thank you? All the owners say it, so we just follow the owner's suit. Okay, so they must require the owners. So you're, you're going to be an owner soon, aren't you? Chick-fil-A owner? And don't, don't give Mrs. Dollins any Chick-fil-A if you become an owner. <laughs> Keep her pure. Keep her, you know, no, no Chick-fil-A for this lady. Just so she can stand strong against Chick-fil-A. He thinks they make the owners say it. Anyway, when you go to Chick-fil-A and you say thank you, they say my pleasure. Now, um, I, Dr. Bill Rice was saying that he went to McDonald's one time and he said thank you. And the lady said, my pleasure. And he said, you're from Chick-fil-A, aren't you? Like a McDonald's spy. <laughs> <laughs> at Chick-fil-A, she says, yeah, I, I used to work at, at Chick-fil-A. So she says, my pleasure. And some people even you know, get messed up from eating there too much and start saying when you say thank you. Instead of saying, you're welcome, like a you know a polite person with instead they say my pleasure indoctrination it's a Chick-fil-A thing isn't it to say my pleasure in other words not only are you welcome but I actually was pleased to serve you that's the mindset of a Chick-fil-A worker that's part of their orientation isn't it to teach that kind of a mindset Chick-fil-A out of the fast food restaurants actually runs their restaurant better than everybody else and that's something that's pretty well indisputable you get better customers. Whatever the, the level is in a city uh, or a town, if you could expect just from the general population of the town to be either courteous or discourteous, whatever the culture of the town is, Chick-fil-A will usually be a little bit better than whatever is normal. And that's kind of one of the things I believe that they orient you to. I don't want to talk about that too much. I just wanted to use it to illustrate that a company or a position does carry it with it, doesn't it, behavior that is representative and a disciple certainly is a representative of his master. And if we're disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're representatives of whom? Jesus. Thank you, Tony. We're representatives of Jesus. Okay, so now Jesus said, this is what you are then. First of all, he said, you, ye, are the salt of the earth. And he said, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Here's a purpose statement. You may say, well, I don't know what my purpose in life is. Well, Jesus said, if you're his disciple, that you're the salt of the earth. And he emphasized and pointed out something that's true and important. He said, if the salt have lost its savor, how's the earth going to be salted? 
My friend, I want to ask you a practical question. Why is it that in this world so many people have never heard that God loves them and that Jesus died on the cross for their sin? Is it God's will that no one should hear the gospel or that some should not? Is that God's will? No. No. I'll tell you why a lot of people haven't heard the gospel is because the salt lost its savor. Jesus said to His disciples, He said, If the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? My friend, if you don't preach the gospel, then you're not fulfilling your purpose in life. And if you're not fulfilling your purpose in life, then a lot of what God wills or wants to be done will not be. It's rather important that salt realizes its purpose. It's rather important. My friend, where, where are you and I supposed to be salt? Now we know what salt is. Let me just ask a practical question. How many of you guys eat a sodium-free or salt-free diet? How many of you guys are salt-free, sodium -free? Oh, praise the Lord. This is good. How many of you, how many of you would have... You're salt-free, Charlie? Low sodium? You're a low sodium guy? That, that jacket's not low sodium. <laughs> uh, Alright, most of us, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm an excessive salter. Uh, you know how things are good or bad, you never know what to believe? Like milk? Is milk good or bad? Nobody knows. Is uh, Are eggs good or bad? Nobody knows. Coconut! Coconut! Uh, uh, oil right now. Do you know coconut oil is now bad? It was wonderful for a while. It was the best thing in the world. It, I mean, it causes everything now. It causes cancer, heart disease, all that stuff. Coconut oil is bad now. And, you know, I just, I, it's just tough to live sometimes trying to figure out something that's good or bad. For a long, long time, we've heard that salt's bad for you, and now we're hearing so, yeah, everybody needs quite a bit of salt, and salt actually isn't the cause of a lot of things. It may affect high blood pressure, but it isn't the cause of it, and other things are affecting it. You know, we just kind of oh, back and forth. Well, I'll just tell you this. I'm a salter. When I eat food, uh, I have some very, very strong opinions about food. And my opinion about food is that meat ought to be salty. If it's beef or chicken or pork or whatever type of meat it is, my opinion is it needs to have some salt in it. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, I'm not a sugar meat person. Some people think that meat needs to have sugar on it. Or, uh, you know, it needs to be sweet tasting. And now, I'm going to just tell you, I, I've had some good barbecue if it's compensated. If you make sweet barbecue sauce, both spicy by putting a lot of heat in it and then putting a lot of uh, salt in it. If it's salty, then barbecue sauce is okay. But if it's too sweet, I just soon not have the barbecue sauce. We need salt on meat. And so I'm a salter. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, I like salt. If... If um, I'm one of those guys, you know, that they call presumptuous, but because I, before I begin to eat, I put salt on. I had a lady one time, she was trying to insult me, and it would have succeeded if I'd been sensitive, but it just, I'm the wrong guy. And she was trying to be mean to me, and my wife had, had uh, prepared something, and she was, she would, for whatever reason, they were eating with us, and, and I, grabbed my, uh, I grabbed the salt shaker, and I salted my food before after we prayed before we eat and she says you know what they say about people that that uh, salt their food before they taste it I said yeah they say they're presumptuous that's what they say about the people and uh, you know it was meant as an insult and I said I and I actually am I fit the qualification for it I presume my wife doesn't put salt on it because she knows I'll do it myself and I just you know I, I'm very presumptuous actually I had a lot of things I presume and you know so I guess it, it, it could be true. I'm definitely not breaking the case study. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, but I'm a salter, and I realize the importance of salt. <clears throat> I don't want to talk about salt all day. I, you know, in, in the context, I've heard messages preached where they emphasize the fact that Roman soldiers, a lot of them were paid with salt instead of money, that it was actually a commodity that you could trade and, you, and actually purchase things with. That really has nothing to do with anything. Uh, really, the context here is savor or flavor. And that's the only context, actually, in context if you study it careful. The flavor aspect of it. And the question that the Scripture, or that Jesus is asking the disciples very, very distinctly is, if you don't have flavor, if you are not providing savor, if you are not salty salt, if you will, then how is the world going to be salted? 
Well, now, guys, let's think about this because there's an important doctrine here. You know, one of the things that when I ponder the things of God that amazes me is that God uses us to preach the gospel. Whenever I think about preaching the gospel, I'm always amazed that God uses people. If you study the Scripture carefully, you'll see there are three elements in any person's getting saved. Three things that God uses for the gospel to be preached. He uses His Word. He uses His Spirit. And He uses His Messenger. Three things. The Word is the Scripture. The Spirit is God's Holy Spirit. And the Messenger is the believer or the disciple who preaches the gospel. Now, if, if it were me that were going to devise a plan to get the gospel preached through the entire earth, I would have a twofold plan. I'd use the Word and the Scripture, and, uh, or I'm sorry, I'd use the, the Word and the Scripture, the Word and the Spirit. I'd have, I would have the Word of God, however God could do it, just supernaturally conveyed. God gave His Word supernaturally, so it wouldn't be a stretch for God just to make His Word, you know, appear in front of people. Or whatever. And the second thing I do is I just have the Holy Spirit of God preach the gospel message. I would subtract the, the human element in it because humans are so fallible, aren't they? But my friend, that isn't how God did it. When God has the gospel be preached to the ends of the earth, He uses a messenger. And the messenger are, messengers are His disciples. If you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a gospel preacher, and that is your primary purpose in life. And the argument or the question Jesus is making, or the argument Jesus is making through the question, is that if you aren't salty, how is the world going to be salty? And the rhetorical answer to the question is, it is not. And friend, that ought to be something that we take very, very seriously. You and I ought to very, very carefully, very, very seriously ponder the question of what if I don't preach the gospel? What if I don't preach the gospel? You say, Pastor, well, God's sovereign. God will see to it that the gospel is preached in spite of you, in spite of me. The Bible doesn't teach that God preaches the gospel in spite of the preacher not preaching the gospel. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. The Bible teaches that if the salt has lost its savor, the earth isn't going to be salted. You say, Pastor, you mean people will go to hell if I don't do what I'm supposed to do? Well, friend, when I do what I'm supposed to do, people go to heaven. When I preach the gospel, people get saved. You show me in the Bible. You, know, you can come up with a scripture you take from its context. I realize that. You show me in the Bible where the Bible says preach the gospel and it doesn't matter if you do or don't. Preach the gospel. You're supposed to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and if you do or if you don't, it'll all be the same outcome because God's just going to save who He wants and whoever He wants to uh, doesn't want to save is going to go to hell. You know, the Bible doesn't teach that gospel. John Calvin teaches that. Catholicism teaches that. Augustine teaches that. A bunch of apostate preachers teach that, but the Bible doesn't. God uses disciples to preach the gospel. God uses disciples to be saver, to be salt in the earth. Now we do know that salt does have different effects, don't we? You ever been wounded and uh, gotten a little cut or something and been in salt water? What does it do when, what does salt do to a wound? It burns, and at the same time, if it's pure salt water, it also sanitizes it. Salt has a burning, sanitizing effect. You say, Pastor, you know, if I just preach the gospel everywhere I go, you know, I mean, that's going to that's gonna be a little disruptive. Well, it's actually intended to be. It's actually intended to be. That's the purpose of preaching the gospel. Listen, if a person is going to reject Jesus and go to hell, he needs to be pretty clear about it, doesn't he? If a person is going to reject the gospel, the good news that Jesus died on the cross for his sin and that Jesus is the only way for salvation, he needs to be pretty clear about what he's doing, doesn't he? Sometimes when I preach the gospel, I think, you know, I just don't want to get in anybody's face. I don't want to aggravate or irritate anybody. And it really, my thoughts on it is, I need to be careful not to be in the spirit. I mean, not to be in the spirit, not to be in the flesh when I preach the gospel. You know, sometimes my flesh, I'm, I'm one of those, you know, snarky kind of a personalities. I kind of a, have a snappy, sarcastic response a lot of times. You know me, and I, and I pick on you at all. You, you may know that 
just kind of comes out of me. I have a lot of dripping sarcasm oozing from my pores, I think, sometimes. Sometimes I want to say things to people and it's in the flesh. But you know what? Years ago, the Spirit of God convinced me about even if people don't want to hear the truth about Jesus, they still need to, and I still need to tell them. There are people that before I can say anything, say I don't want to hear it. I still need to tell them. They still need to know. You know, if somebody is going to go to hell, I want them to have to do quite a bit of climbing to get there. I want them to have to go through the effort of going there. I don't want it to be easy for someone to go to hell. Not because I want to make their life difficult, but because I don't want them to go to hell. And Jesus doesn't. And it's important, my friend, that believers who know the Lord Jesus take the responsibility of discipleship very, very seriously and realize that if I don't do what I'm supposed to, it won't be done. My friend, in preaching about spiritual gifts in the church, I've realized that this is true in the church as well. Do you know what happens if you as a member of the local body don't serve? You know what happens in the church, in the local body, if you as a member don't serve? Tell you what happens. Nothing. Things that ought to get done don't. There is so much in our church that ought to be done that isn't being done because people don't serve. And I used to think, well, you know what, God's... You know, people aren't that important. You know, God's work is going to go forth. God's work is going to be done. No, actually, God's plan is that rather important. His plan is to use disciples to preach the gospel and to do the ministry. And if you don't do what God created you for, my friend, your purpose is not going to be accomplished. God has a purpose for your life, and it's important. And if you don't even know what it is, my friend, you're not very salty. The world doesn't have the savor it needs. The world needs me to be salty. There you go, millennials that like to use that term. I think some millennials, they like to say the word salty a lot. I think that they read some pirate books or something where they used to use it a lot. All my pirate books talk about being salty. Salty sailors and salty this, salty that. And uh, I think that's where they get it from. Or maybe they just got it from the Scripture. My friend, you and I need to be the salt of the earth, don't we? God created us for a purpose, and if we don't perform our purpose, then... Uh, God's plan is not done. Okay, then the Bible uses a second illustration. Jesus uses a second illustration for His disciples. He said in verse 14, You're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. And He said, A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, from a strategic standpoint, putting a city on a hill, you're always going to know where the city is, aren't you? Uh, where I grew up in Kansas, it isn't that way anymore. There are people within a within a mile of our farmhouse now. It's, you know, as the crow flies, it would take more than a mile to drive there. But where our farmhouse was, when I was growing up, it, you had, it took about eight miles to get to the next person. We were out, kind of out in the boonies. And it's, sometimes if you've never experienced it before, you should go out in the country and experience darkness. The sky at nighttime is very, very beautiful. The stars are lovely. There's just a lot going on. And there are a lot of things that go bump in the night that will scare you to death too. And noises. You know, you know, animals are pretty scary at nighttime. Owls, owls, and coyotes, and all these things. You should try it just to, just for the fun of it. I think to go somewhere. My point, though, is that if you if you're in a dark place, and there is a city, you can actually see in the sky a city coming up. Sometimes I'll be driving, and I'll be going some place, and I'll be out in the country driving and not obviously in southeast Florida, but be in some other state. I remember like Texas would be a good example of it. And maybe you're, you're coming from uh, Dallas to Shreveport, Louisiana. And as you're starting to get closer to Shreveport, Louisiana, everything's dark outside. But you start to notice that there's a brightness in the sky. The sky actually has a glow to it. And you realize, okay, I must not be... I must be about 20 or 30 miles from the city because I can see the sky is glowing. It's lit up ahead of me. Why? Well, the city's there. And if you have a city on, if you're ever driving through the mountains and you see a little town on a mountainside or on the top of a mountain, boy, you can see that thing for forever away, can't you? A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. And the point of it is light. Light is something you can't hide. The Bible says that we, as disciples, are the light 
of the world. Ye, Jesus said to his disciples. Can you, can you envision this right now? Can you envision the twelve and then the followers? He had other disciples besides the twelve apostles. Can you imagine them just in a setting around Jesus and he's looking at them and saying, Ye are the light of the world. Now how big of an influence would the twelve and the disciples of Jesus have actually been? You ever think about that? How great of an influence would the twelve apostles and the disciples, maybe a hundred or so followers of Jesus, in light of the entire world have been? They would seem rather insignificant, wouldn't they? Let me ask you a question. How far away can a light be seen? You know the little bow lights on a boat? The, the old ones, not the not the, the new ones, but just the old little 12-volt dim bow light on a boat. You know, you can see a, a bow light, Coast Guard specification is that a bow light needs to be visible for two miles. You ever look at a bow light on a boat? You're, if, you're, if you're piloting a boat, that thing's not putting out enough light for you to be able to navigate by it. It's not putting out light at all. You need a spotlight to be able to navigate. But yet, if there's a boat and it's got its bow light on, you can see it for two miles away. Whereas it lights up the spot where it's at. You say, Pastor, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really actually a spotlight. I don't see how I can light up the world. Well, the Bible isn't saying that you're lighting up the world. The Bible says you can be seen by the world as light. You see the difference in perspective? If I'm sitting next to a bow light and I'm trying to see everything around me, I'm not going to see very far. But I'll tell you something, anybody from anywhere can see me. You're the light of the world. Small wonder then that disciples need to keep their lives pure. Small wonder that disciples need to understand that their testimony is one of utmost importance. Why? You're the light of the world. People are watching you. People see you. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. And you don't want to hide yourself. Not only, not only is a light visible for a long distance, but the second aspect of light is that you don't try to cover it up. Neither does anyone, the Bible says, you to, to take a candle and put it under a basket. You don't light a candle and, and then try to, you know dark it out so you can't see it. Why do you light a candle? So that you can see. So that you can create light. And Jesus here is warning the disciples not to be hypocritical. Don't be light and try to pretend to be darkness. Small wonder a disciple feels so pathetic, so miserable when he isn't light. My friend, if you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to be able to pretend your darkness it's not what you're made for. It's not what you're created for, and you'll never be right. Okay, so a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Let's finish up. Verse 15, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a basket, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then the command follows in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The source of the light is not you. The source of good works is not you, actually. A believer who actually does good works the way that the discipleship is taught reflects on the Father. A person who does good works reflects on the Father. Let me just use this for an illustration. Like any illustration, it falls short of fully illustrating it. But I have seen promises in the Scripture that have to do with the influence of light. There's one... Uh, for instance, that has to do with wives having unbelieving husbands. You remember this? When, the, when a wife has an unbelieving husband, she is supposed to do what? Well, she's supposed to be such a wife that actually she's, her, her husband is won by her conversation. He's an unbeliever. He doesn't believe in Jesus. She has believed in Jesus. And because of the way that she responds and treats her husband... Her husband ultimately becomes a believer. You know, I've seen that verse misunderstood and misapplied terribly. I've seen women that take the Bible 
and they tell their unbelieving husband what a terrible person he is. And they, when they go to church, I'm going to church, and if you, if you were any good at all, you'd go too. And I'm this and that and that, and she talks about, no, I'm not doing that right now. I have to read my Bible. Or da 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 da. And she, I'm telling you, she's mean and she's nasty, and she beats her husband with the Bible. Have you ever seen a Christian that beats people with Bibles? I mean, they just use the Bible for a club to let you know how inadequate and how awful and how terrible you are. My friend, that isn't, that doesn't reflect on God very well, does it? I don't know how many times people use biblical truth for a club or for a weapon. In other words, they use it externally instead of internally. Internal truth is actually never offensive. If a woman sees the way she ought to believe and the way she ought to behave and internalizes it, she'll be sweet. If a man internalizes what the Scripture says about what a man ought to be, he's going to be loving, isn't he? But I've seen people, oh, you can't do this, this is what the Bible says, and they use it externally. In other words, the Bible is to be applied for you, and let's just ignore the spirit that I have in applying it for me. And you know, disciples, disciples apply the Scripture <coughs> internally, not externally. The Bible says that you're the salt of the earth. Now, my friend, how in the world can I be salty by being what I'm supposed to be as a Christian, by doing what I'm supposed to be? The Bible says you're the light of the world. How is it that I can be light? Well, the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Tom Malone, in one of his books on soul winning, used an illustration that I like a great deal. Uh, he talked about a man in his church who was a deacon in his church who was just a, a, just a good man, just a good Christian man. He talked about somebody uh, that was the man's neighbor that he had been witnessing to for a long time. And when he actually went to visit this man to share the gospel with him, he realized he was a neighbor of a man in his church, one of the deacons in his church. And Tom Malone said, I tried to share the gospel with this man and I gave him the gospel and he just wasn't interested. He just wouldn't believe it. He finally said, he said, well, do you know your neighbor, brother so-and-so? And the guy said, yeah, he is. And he says, well, what do you think about him? And he said, he's the best man I know. And he said, well, don't you think that everybody should be like that? And literally because of the conversation, because of the way the man lived, the way he treated his neighbor, the man received Jesus as his Savior. In other words, when what Tom Malone, what he said had no effect on the man. He didn't see his need for salvation. What he saw in his neighbor who actually lived for Jesus did have the effect. I hate to say it, but I've seen the opposite as well. That guy says he's a Christian. I want to tell you, he curses like a sailor. That guy says he's a Christian. I want to tell you, you catch him on a bad day, and he'll... That guy says he's a Christian, and I mean, do you do a business deal with him? And you know what will happen? Oh, my friend, we better be careful as disciples of the Lord Jesus, to remember that men are to see our good works. Our light is to so shine before men that they see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Friend, a say-so gospel is important, isn't it? But the conversation of the gospel, the conversation of discipleship, is of even greater importance. And Jesus is helping His disciples to realize, hey, disciple isn't a title. Disciple is a mindset. And disciple is an activity or an action. Last week we saw the mindset of the disciple. This week we see the activity or the action of the disciple. Next week we're actually going to look at Jesus, a little excerpt where he talks about the law. I wish I could have gotten there today, but we're out of time this morning. And so I really just want to conclude this morning. The conclusion uh, always draws kind of the net, if you will, and, and makes things practical for us here today. And I want to be as practical as I possibly can. So let me just be blunt. I think sometimes that's the best way to be practical, isn't it? It should just be straight up. Uh, let me just tell you something bluntly as I possibly can here today. You need Jesus for your Savior. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I just tell you something, it's only Jesus. The, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. 
Every person needs salvation. There are different types of salvation in the Bible, but the great need for salvation I'm talking about in this context today is being saved from the reality that you've sinned against God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that God will judge your sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let me just be as frank as I possibly can. Everyone sinned. Everyone without Jesus my friend, is going to be judged by God, and no one survives God's judgment. And that's why Jesus died in our place and took our judgment for us. God offered a sacrifice in your place and in my place. The sacrifice was that of His perfect Son. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And you need Jesus. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that the way to receive Him is to look to Him. And that's pretty simple actually, isn't it? You don't have to be a disciple to receive Jesus as your Savior. You have to look to Jesus. You have to look from your sin. You have to look from whatever it is that you are trusting instead of Jesus and just look to Jesus, His cross alone. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose again. The way I looked to Jesus when I was a youth was this. I just prayed a simple prayer to God. It wasn't exactly this, but I, this, this is what I said in my heart. God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know Jesus died for my sin. And I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. I want Jesus. You know, a guy could pray that today, understanding what I just said. You could just say, I want Jesus, and God would save you. That's looking to Jesus. Second area of application this morning is this. You either are a disciple or you're not. Salvation doesn't make you a disciple. <laughs> Following Jesus does. Either you're a disciple or you're not. And I would say that a person who is a disciple always is, wouldn't you? So we really have two categories of people this morning. We have people who are either disciples of Jesus and people who aren't disciples of Jesus. If you're not a disciple of Jesus, it's because you've never made a decision to follow. You just you, you never decided you're going to follow Jesus. Now, I didn't say you haven't decided whether you're going to receive Jesus for your Savior, but you've never with your life said, I'm going to follow Jesus. And that's a decision that has to be made. If you've already made the decision to follow Jesus, sometimes you get a little confused with how you stand, don't you? Has anyone ever been a perfect disciple of Jesus? Never has anyone been a perfect disciple of Jesus. Peter was a pretty pathetic example of a disciple for a while, was he not? But was he still a disciple? He wasn't a good one, but he was a disciple. <laughs> I like the way a Puerto Rican friend of mine used to put things. He was, this guy, he's, he's with the Lord now, but his name was Tony Caraballo. And he, he just had a lot of funny ways of saying things. And he would ask guys really blunt relationships, particularly single guys, or blunt questions about relationships. Single guys. And I remember him asking a guy in our church about a girl. And, uh, and then he says something like, I'm a psychiatrist. This is Tony. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not a very good one. He says after him. He's trying to give him relationship advice. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not a very good one. And <laughs> he's just laughable. It's funny. Well, you might be a disciple, but you might not be a very good one. And there's a pretty simple test for that. Are you salt? And are you light? That's the test. If the salt has lost its savor, it's thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You just use it. Bad salt, you know, they throw on the sidewalk to melt snow. Good pure salt, they use to flavor food. Pretty simple. You a disciple? Well, if you never made the decision to be a disciple, it could be your decision is I need to be saved and then I need to follow Jesus. You say, well, pastor, I'm a disciple. I'm not a very good one. Well, then what do you do with that? I've decided to follow Jesus. That's what you do with that. And I don't know what page number that is, but that is our invitation song this morning. I'm going to pray in just a moment, and then we're going to sing. I've decided to follow Jesus, and our invitation is if you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, uh, then this will be the time, this will be the hour. We'll be able to help you with that. I'll give you instructions in a morning, in a minute. And uh, if you are saved and you're a disciple, but you're not a very good one, then it will be a time to respond to what God has spoken to you.
here just a minute. Let me look this up and then I'll, have to, I'll dismiss in prayer. Um, okay, there it is, 397. All right, thank you. All right, let's pray. Father, I just ask that you would bless and move in the invitation. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me just describe before I have everyone stand what the invitation is. You could go ahead and take your blue handbooks books and find page 397 while I'm explaining it. The invitation is just a time where I invite you to respond to what God's Word says. I don't know about you, but I just kind of feel like this is a shotgun style of a message. You know, a rifle, you shoot a bullet at a particular spot or a target. A shotgun, you shoot it kind of at an area. And I feel like this is a message that kind of just ought to hit every one of us. You're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. I hope the message got you this morning. You can't be a disciple without being a believer, without being saved. Brother Taj is in the back of the room to deal with the matter of salvation. And so if you're here this morning, you don't know for sure that you're on your way to heaven, that you have eternal life. Brother Taj, during while we're singing, I have decided to follow Jesus. You can just go and say, Brother Taj, can you show me how I can know for sure that I'm saved? might be that you need to make a particular decision, like joining the church. Maybe God said, you know, a good disciples kind of joined up to a local body and serving with them. Maybe that's a decision you need to make. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's just a matter of preaching the gospel. You know what? I don't preach the gospel, and I'm not light. I'm not salt, and I'm not light. But the invitation is a time when we invite you, instead of just hearing truth, walking away from it, to stop and say, okay, I've heard it. God, you've talked to me, and here's my answer. The invitation is a time we invite you to answer God. And the answer this morning would be, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. We're going to sing page 397. If you'd stand to your feet, and we'll sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. While we sing, uh, if, if God's spoken to you, you can uh, speak to Brother Taj or myself, and uh, just respond to God. Don't let God talk to you and not respond to Him. I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back. No turning back. Folks are praying. If God's dealt with you, do business with Him while we sing. Verse 2. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. On the third. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Before we dismiss, let me just mention a couple of things. You know, I think nothing uh, nothing reminds you of how frail and how human you are than being responsible to preach the gospel to people. I felt today in many ways that I've stammered and uh, had a hard time speaking and had a hard time formulating thoughts and conveying them. And you know, what that reminds me about is, is that I'm just a human element. I want to just tell you something. This book that we're preaching about, the message may not be eloquent, but it's true. And... You don't need pastor to persuade you. You need the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to persuade you. And that's what I'm depending on here today. Something else I want to mention to you this morning is that I'm grateful to have the opportunity to preach the Word of God to you. I'm just so grateful God brought you here today. And I just want to thank you for coming. It means the world to me that you're here. And I know you didn't come here because of me today, and you shouldn't come because of me. But it still means the world to me. And so I wanted to express gratitude to you. Sometimes I tell you uh, that I feel like I'm the most privileged person in the world to get to pastor this church. And I haven't said that maybe for a couple of weeks, and so let me say that as well. I think that it's just a great privilege not only to know you, but I feel like God has allowed me just to be the pastor of the best people in the world. And I just love you, and I'm so thankful. I thank God very, very often for you 
and that he has given me the ministry of being able to serve you. And I want you to know that I'm your servant. If you need something this week, if you need help with something, you need someone to talk to, uh, if you need anything at all, my friend, will you please tell me and will you give me the opportunity to see what I can do to be able to serve you? I would count it the greatest privilege to be able to do what a pastor does and to help you spiritually. I would love to do that. So if I can serve you in that way at all, uh, I want to do so. I hope you know my heart in that. And then the last thing I would say to you this morning is about the invitation here. If you're leaving here today and God's spoken to you but you haven't responded to Him, the invitation's never over. We close a service, but God's not going to stop talking to you about it. And the sooner you do business with Him, the sooner and better off you'll be where you need to be. And so go ahead and respond. If you need help after the service, you need to chat with me about a spiritual matter or something else, uh, that's a good time to do that. We do have time for you, even though the invitation or the service closes because the invitations never close. Aren't you glad? that while you're living and you're breathing, that that's a strong indication that God hasn't given up on you. God's not through with you yet. And He's given you life because you have a purpose and you have a plan. Now let's go out and let's serve God with our lives. Charlie, will you please dismiss us in prayer? All right, Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for the truth. Lord, of your word, your salt and your light, Lord, I pray, Father, now that uh, you help us uh, be effective salt and light this week. Lord, draw many people you give us by appointments or every now that you help us get home safe and thank you for speaking to us praise in jesus name amen, amen.